Well, we're continuing our series. When you're going through hell, don't stop. Everyone goes through the fire. Just not everyone gets burned. This morning, we want to talk about disappointment. And in everything you do, get, see, relate to, you're going to find at some point disappointment. I think sometimes when we present, at least for me, when Christianity was presented to me, there were a lot of high and mighty promises I thought I heard. Like if you love God, you'll get a pass. That if you love God, you have all the money. And tithe, you have all the money you ever want. That if you love God, you can go to church every seven days, 52 weeks a year for your entire life. That nothing bad will ever happen to you. That gas prices will not go up for you. The taxes will not go up for you. And if you're a Baptist, you are a shoe in if you visit the Holy Land, i.e. Nashville. <laughs> a lot of crazy things that religious people promise in order to get us to love God. I have to be honest with you that by the time I got to be a preteen, I, was very, I felt very sorry for God. Really, because nobody loved him, nobody cared about him. He, you know, he died on a cross, and people are ignoring him. They don't go to church, going out to the lake, which is sinful. Amen. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> Smoking cigarettes and pushing each other down in the parking lot and just having fun, and that's wrong, right? And somehow, <coughs> I built up in my mind that if you really love God your life would be a gravy train and biscuit wheels and nothing would happen. Now, add religion into that, which says that if you love God and something happens, then it's your fault. You haven't loved God enough. You haven't given enough. You haven't served enough. You haven't worshiped enough. I mean, I've, I've heard all my life, read your Bible, pray. And you know what? And sometimes I read my Bible and fall asleep. That's never happened to you? I guarantee you, if you have not fallen asleep or nodded off while you're praying, you do not belong here. <laughs> leave. Leave your money, but leave. Uh, yeah. Somehow we have this idea that if we are disciplined, that somehow, uh, that if, if, if we really just had our heart right, we would never face really bad disappointments. We'd never, have you ever awakened one day and say, I didn't sign up for this, right? You know, I didn't. The, the poster didn't say this would ever happen, but this is a part of our journey. As a matter of fact, God is committed. Hold on to your you know, shorts here. God is committed to your constant, continual disappointment so that your life will be focused on him, not what he does and not what he gives. You're never going to find complete satisfaction your marriage, and your children, and your job, and your life, and your stuff, as good as those things are, and as much of a gift as those things are, God will never allow you to take the created and replace the creator. And when you do, your life literally arrives at a place of deep, dark disappointment, which leads to depression. A lot of people are depressed because they're disappointed. And somebody told them they should never be disappointed. Let's use this scriptural reference this morning in the life of Peter. Peter was, you know, one of the disciples. He was the big mouth, big fisted fisherman who was bold. Oh, you know, he was one of these, you know, uh, open mouth insert foot, right? He was fire ready aim, right? He was like a lot of us. Going to hear an amen. Come on. We got a lot more zeal than we have knowledge. And Peter was always, you know, one step ahead of everybody. He was kind of the leader or self-appointed leader, I guess, in his mind of the disciples. And so he, he is, can you imagine Peter taking up a pen to write anything, you know, and, but he's writing this epistle, this letter. And he starts out by saying, I want to write to all the exiles, who are scattered, or the church, the early church, soon after the death of Christ and the growth of the church got persecuted. And that's the way it grew in the entire world. It's like, if you ever pour gasoline on, you got, uh, you know, catch gasoline on fire and try to put it out and it just goes like that. And that's what happened is the church was persecuted and the fire of it just went like that. And so Peter is writing to those who have been dispersed. And he says in verse six, and all this all this persecution and all the fact they've got to leave their homes and all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer 
grief and all kinds of trials. I said at the beginning of this series, you have to understand that for all of us, for God to forge our faith into a firsthand reality, we're going to go through temptations, trials, and testing, right? Trials have to do with your emotion. They're attacking your feelings. Then he says, and this is in your outline, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined in fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor. The proven genuineness of your faith. It's one thing to stand up in church and say, praise the Lord. It's another thing to get gut kicked and still have your faith intact. It's one thing to say, I love Jesus, and your wife be sleeping with your best friend. Amen? And still wake up with your faith intact. This is how life is. And sometimes faith is easy to profess, but harder to possess. And it is a confession working itself out into reality. And disappointment, disappointment is one of the fires we go through And God sometimes just sets us up for. We think somehow, I I, I really do believe, we think Jesus is a nice. For me, when I I was raised in a small county seat town, uh, and Jesus was a white-haired, blue-eyed, blonde, bathrobe-wearing dude from somewhere south of Glasgow. That was kind of my my thinking. That's how I pictured Jesus. I mean, it was a real wake-up call when I realized Jesus was olive-skinned, probably short, And the Old Testament says that he had no comeliness or form that we should desire him. He was just an average-looking guy. But being around him transformed and transfixed those who followed him. His teachings are sometimes misunderstood. There are three ways you want to be disappointed. Let me help you out. Okay? I just want to help you. Some of you you are just mildly disappointed, and you've not been dismally disappointed. Let me help you out. You want to be like really, really lip-dragging, gut-wrenching, disappointed? Cultivate worry. Worry, worry, worry. Worry about everything. I've had people say, I'm a worrier. No, you're not. You choose to worry. This is a choice you make. Well, my father was a worrier. My grandfather was a worrier. My dogs worry. No, 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 no. You don't have worry genes. (laughs) Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. And here's my favorite, your vindication like the noonday sun. God says, you know, trust me, love me, and I will vindicate your trust. I will make sure that you will stand up one day and say, yay, God, the smartest thing I ever did was deposit my soul and my care and my future into the hands of a good God. Stop worrying. What are you going to change? By worrying. You can't change the future. You certainly can't change the past. The only thing you can do is maybe do a little fashioning and shaping on the present, right? Here's what we do. We go on a diet tomorrow. (laughs) Monday's the greatest day of the week, isn't it? Because this afternoon, you're going to go and pig out. Because you're going on a diet tomorrow, tomorrow, right? Cultivate worry. Push everything to the future. You want to be really miserably disappointed? Jump to conclusions. Put a period where God put a comma. Just simply act like you know where this is all leading. God would never do this. Then duck or pucker every time you say that. I, I've heard people, I, I wish I had a dime for every time somebody, I just can't believe in a God that would. Well, dude, you're going to be out in the cold most of your life. Because you may love Jesus and get cancer and die. Matter of fact, you are going to die from something. All these rice cake eating whole foods visiting people are going to be dying from nothing. I'm going to die from something exotic, a name you'll have to look up on Google. Wow, what did he have? I don't know, man. That that long. It's a big old word. You want to worry? You want to really be disappointed? You you, You want to just constantly live your life from this to that to the other thing, constantly upset? 
Here's my favorite way. This is a surefire. The other two are 99%. This is 105% sure to make you miserable. Engage in comparisons. Yeah, baby. Let's talk. You know, come on, and God is watching. You know there are people who are dumber than you, uglier than you, doing better than you. That's not right. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever seen these ugly people who are really successful and you say, how'd they ever get there? Don't they ever watch E? <laughs> they would never be in People Magazine. And you say, yeah, I went to college. You didn't even go to 12th grade. Bill Gates, college dropout. That's not right. I mean, you just look at people and you think, God, this is not fair. And you start comparing yourself to other people. And you always come up on the short end of that stick. Always. Because there's always somebody doing better than you. Always somebody doing worse than you, right? You either, you either judge yourself way too well and better off than you are or way too sick and worse off than you are. I love the teaching of Jesus. I love the fact that Jesus was a renegade. He was not a white Baptist. He was not a Southern boy. He was not sweet and kind. Jesus is nice. Just teach Jesus. Jesus loves the little children. All the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. They are in inside. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Hey, Jesus is PG. Really? Are you sure? Let me give you an example. Peter. Going back to Peter again. This big-fisted, big-mouthed, rugged fisherman. Tatted all. I mean, this guy was tatted up. He had, I mean, you know, he had piercings. He was a dude, man. He was a dude. And so Peter, you know, says, Jesus tells the disciples, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to be crucified. And Peter says, not, not if I've got anything to say about it, right? Jesus looked at Peter and said, oh, that's cute. That's sweet. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. He looked at Peter and said, you're going to lie. You're going to deny you even knew me, you dog. And Peter says, I won't deny you. But he did, didn't he? So it goes through a period after that denial. Jesus goes to the gray, goes to the cross. And the cross isn't that big a deal if there's not a resurrection, by the way. But since there is, it is a big deal. So after the resurrection, Jesus goes and appears to Peter. And they make everything right. You know the famous, you know, do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Why do you love me? Do I love you? Do you really love me? You know, the whole play on agape and, and uh, uh, the, the, the Greek word for, uh, you know, the, the genuine sacrificial love uh, and then phileo and all that stuff. So anyway, they get everything kind of cool there. And so they, so Peter moves on. He's the kind of, you know, thinking about, okay, what's, what's next? And uh, Peter says, you know, what's going to happen to us? And Jesus looks at Peter and says, well, for you, for you only, because you're special. People are going to tie your hands, they're going to take you out, and they're going to kill you. But don't worry, it's going to bring glory to my name. Are we happy yet? Really? Really? And so Peter does what every good Baptist I've ever met does. He deflects and changes the subject. Okay, well, if I got to die, what about John? You know Peter couldn't stand John. He had to because he was a disciple and the disciples were perfect. So he looks at John and says, well, what about him? You know, if I got to die, surely he's going to die. You know, is he going to die like more seriously and sooner than me? Jesus says, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what's that to you? Whoa! Step back. That's not the Jesus I was raised on. Jesus would never be that insulting. You know the dripping, ironic uh, nature of that? Jesus said, if John, if I want John, okay, so Jesus, basically it's just say like 2,000 years, okay? Jesus is saying, Peter, if I want G John to be 2,000 freaking years old, what's that to you? Well, if I'm Peter, I'm saying, that's a lot to me. <laughs> I'm a disciple. Don't you love me? How many times have you ever felt like God loves your brother better? 
God loves Sam better, Fred better, Clarice better. God prefers certain classes of people rather than me. Listen, you engage in comparison to how you're doing, to how everyone else is doing, and you will be miserable the rest of your life. Praise Jesus. Now, what's the remedy to this disappointment? In other words, what is God trying to say to me? Let's illustrate that by just saying what he isn't saying, because this is, I think, what happens when we hear about Christianity, when preachers preach and teachers teach. We hear certain things and we draw conclusions that we shouldn't. So let's talk about the five best things God never said. One, God never said you would never feel lonely, just that you would never be alone. I know an awful lot of Christians who don't go to church because they feel lonely at church. A lot of people don't attend church today. A lot of people are not in churches across America today, even though it's a great privilege bought by blood. Amen. A lot of them are home today, not because they're bad people. They're discouraged. They go to church and they're ignored at church, just like they're ignored at work and ignored at home. They just feel lonely in the midst of a crowd. So God never said you wouldn't feel lonely. I feel lonely sometimes, and I'm surrounded by a lot of people most of the time. I've been at home with my family at home, and I felt lonely. <clears throat> Anyone? Feeling lonely doesn't always translate into the reality that you are alone, especially if you are a follower of Jesus. He will never leave you, never forsake you. That's what the scriptures say. Would you like to be Joshua? Here's a dude who was a leader and trained to Moses, right? Forever, Joshua was the second guy in command. And when you're the second guy, you got it made. Because you can always deflect everything to the guy in charge, right? You think you want to be in charge? Oh, wait just a minute, Mildred. Can you just hear? I know, you know he did it. You know it. Hey, Joshua, what do you think about Moses on this Red Sea thing, holding his hands up? Well, that's, you know, that's one way to do it. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd done that. I'm sure they had, he had people coddling up to him. Well, Joshua, what do you think about what this? You know, Moses is a good guy. He's old. You know what I'm saying? He's senile. Seriously. Hey, by the way, you do know he killed a guy. Just saying. If I killed a guy, no. If I ever held up the rod to part the Red Sea, no, but I was there. How many of you know there's a lot of difference being in the hot seat and in being in the prepared to be hot seat? But all of a sudden Moses dies and now Joshua, hallelujah. He's now going to face the currents all by himself. He is stuck out on the front of that ship, guiding it all by himself. Listen to the promise that God gave him. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life as I was with Moses. I will be with you. Whew, boy, don't you know he breathed a sigh of relief. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Others will forsake you. People will abandon you. They will betray you. Not because they're bad, but because they're human. Do not look to people for what you can only get from God. Remember that movie, Jerry Maguire? And the couple in the elevator, you complete me. That's okay to watch. It's stupid to believe. My wife doesn't complete me, and Lord knows I don't complete her. I drive her crazy. <laughs> kind of like this poem, to dwell above with the people we love, that would be grace and glory. But to live below with the people we know, well, that's another story. I mean, you know this. Enough. You've grown up. You look at, we look at our families and we think, man, you know, they're so ungrateful. They just take stuff. And, you know, stop that. Stop it. Stop. Don't do that. You are destroying your faith. Listen, love God and love people. But love God with a love that where your entire confidence in the future is on him. And love people with his love. Listen, I found this. Loved people are loving people. That's what I found. So just simply stop worrying about 
these feelings of loneliness. In the very beginning, Genesis 1, it's not good man should be alone. I mean, these are feelings we've always had. In Christ, those feelings may occur, but the reality is I'm never alone. He will never leave me, never forsake me. He thought I was a good deal when he bought me and sought me and loved me and brought me, that he still thinks I'm a good deal. I'm a big deal to him, though I may be a little thing to you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Is he a big deal? Yep, yeah, with God he is. Here's the second thing God Best thing God never said. God never said you wouldn't get hurt. Just that he would get you home safely. Now here's another ironic, another view of the renegade Jesus, right? If you've been raised on the limp wristed Jesus, you're not going to like this Jesus. Because Jesus would get in your face. And he would do things that would seem to be odd. For example, John the Baptist. You ever heard of this dude? The Baptist, that's biblical. That's why some people are Baptists. I don't know. But, you know, he's, he's the guy who comes. He is, by earthly standards, the cousin of Jesus. He is the clarion voice. He is kind of the bridge between the Old and New Testament. These 400 years of silence is broken by the voice of a guy wearing camel hair swimsuit. <laughs> Eating bugs. Whole food, dude. I mean, you know, that's where that stove comes from. So, so he, he, he comes and he gives, he's baptizing Jesus, which is a, a bridging idea of the, you know, of, of the Jews now need to be proselyted and all this other. It's a beautiful, beautiful biblical image and idea and bridging and connection. But basically, John just sticks his neck out, you know, and it gets him in, landed in jail. And he sticks his neck out and he's going to lose his head, literally. So and he's in jail. Now, he gets this. He, he doesn't get to be in on the cool stuff of Jesus. He doesn't get to be on Jesus the summer tour. <laughs> right? He just gets to be in Jesus to baptize by yourself with rocks and goats. Right? And so he, he's in jail, and he's hearing all of these cool things that Jesus is doing. People come, got all access pass, going to the back, seeing what Jesus is doing. And so John sends one of his guys to Jesus and says this. When John heard in prison what Jesus was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect another? Now, again, I've been to seminary, and let, so let me just chop this up for you. What John is asking is this. Trust me, okay? Can you trust me? I'm not going to lead you too far into the you know, ditch. But what John is saying is, are you going to get me out of here? He knew who Jesus was. He had already baptized him. It wasn't like, duh. The dude knew before everybody else did. He's saying, I'm in jail for you. You're over there having a party, turning water into wine. That's wrong right there. Raising people from the dead. I bet that'd be cool. Recovering of sight, preaching good news to the poor, right? And so Jesus hears this and says, he sends another cryptic message back, which John all too easily interprets. Go back and report to John what you see. Now, this is cruel. First, it was a rumor. Now, he says, tell him everything. Embellish if you want to. Describe it in full color. Tell how cool it is. Tell how, many, how much money the offerings are. Telling about the buses we travel in. The fact that it's got a bathroom in the back. It's really cool. We got DVDs. We got Apple. We got iPods. It's cool. Tell him everything. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive the sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are... I mean, how much more... Load the wagon, right? And then he says, tell him this. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Does that make sense? This is what Jesus is saying. John, I love you, dude, and you're going to die in prison. I'm not going to set you free. I'm not coming to your rescue. You're going to die. Can you handle it? Can you love me then? Boy, that, I'm sorry, that's brutal. I don't even think Jesus would kill me. I'd say, that's unfair. 
I mean, it's not, for, well, I mean, back up, Jesus. I think it's okay for everybody else. Just don't treat me that way. <laughs> Bob can get cancer, but just don't let Dave get it. Right? Fred can lose his job just to let, you know, protect, build an edge of protection around me. I mean, we somehow think that if, that, and we've told people, I've heard it with my own ears, just love Jesus, man, and you'll never get sick, and life would be, you know, it's not God's will that anyone gets sick. Now, figure that one. I've heard that. I'm not, have you heard this before? I've heard this. I'm thinking, wouldn't we be overpopulated? If everyone who lived would still be living, it'd be crowded. I'm glad those people are dead. How about you? It's crowded enough. They need to die to make room for us. Does this make sense to anyone but me? You know, I mean, you know, seriously. God says, you know what? I don't care how good your life is. One day you're going to leave this earth. One day you're going to get sick. One day something's going to happen. You know what? God says, you know, you're, you're going to get hurt. You're going to experience pain. I'm just going to get you home safely. Amen. That's what I want to know. <coughs> he says, I'm going to get you there. You'll feel lonely, but you'll never be alone. I'll never forsake you. Listen, you, you, life will hurt, but I'm going to get you home safely. Third, God never said you wouldn't lose. Just that nothing of significance would ever be lost. Yay, God. I love this out of 2 Timothy. Paul is speaking to his young protege, this young pastor that he's mentoring. He said, this is why I'm suffering as I am, yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I believe and am convinced that he is able to guard. The word guard there, when Paul and I moved to Nashville in 1975, believe it or not, to go to college, we bought a little house over on Sentinel Drive. And I only learned in seminary later or college, Bible college later when I was studying Greek what sentinel means, and it's this word right here, to guard, to build a wall around. And Paul is saying to Timothy, listen, I'm suffering, I'm in prison, I'm going through dark days, but you know what? I'm absolutely confident in the one whom I have deposited my soul. I have entrusted him. With my soul. Yes, I may have had some losses, but nothing of significance can ever be lost. What can you really lose? You cannot love his love. You cannot lose his love. You cannot lose his promises. You cannot lose his, prominent, uh, his prominence, providence. You cannot lose the promise of his place. Right? Everything I've ever needed, I still have. There are no hearses. You hauls behind hearses. He hello? Hello? Two guys were at a funeral of a very, very wealthy man in their community. And they were there just kind of talking. One of them said to the other, man, how much did the, how much did the old boy leave behind? And the other guy said, all of it. <laughs> yeah. All the things we think we got to have, all the things we gather up and pile up and gathered ourselves. Yay, God. Every good and perfect gift comes down the, from the Father of life. Man, if you got a boat, take me out. You got a nice house and food? Fight me over. I mean, you got nice stuff? Yay, God. Yeah, yay, God. But it ain't God. And it's all going back in the box. It's all going to wear out. Somebody else is going to be playing with your toys one day off of eBay. <laughs> the boat you bought for $18,000 plus interest played $39,000. Somebody's going to buy for $3,100. You're going to go, oh, my Lord. You never said you wouldn't feel lonely just that you would never be alone. Don't look at God and say, you never said, you never said. Yes, he did. He never said that you wouldn't lose, that just nothing of significance would be lost. He also never said that your life would be easy. Just that the struggle would be worth it. You know what I found? Everything in my life that I have that I value has been hard. Is that true for you? College was hard, golly. I mean, I would never forget. This is so funny. I've been a pastor. I started being a pastor when I was 18 years old. Now, you, when you're a Baptist, that's legal. You got a pulse and a Bible, they'll let you be a pastor. So, 
So, you know, I'm, so, and I, and I, so I, when I went to Bible college, I thought, you know what, I know the Bible. I've been speaking for God for years, and, man, Bible college would be a gravy train. I mean, I'll just slip right through it. So I go to the first day. We're going to have a, a Bible, a New Testament survey class. I'm like, Pfft. I've read the New Testament like 700 gajillion times. And then he says, the guy, the professor says, and we're going to be involved in exegesis of the scripture. Now, I'm from Kentucky. I'm not the brightest tool in the drawer. You know what I'm saying? He said exegesis. I heard extra Jesus. <laughs> extra. Then I went to Greek class. Oh, my Lord. And I went home that day, and I looked told. She said, how'd it go? I said, I'm quitting. <laughs> I said, in one class, we got to study Greek. I ain't, I ain't even conquered English yet. <laughs> and in another class, we're going to study extra Jesuses. <laughs> and my wife said, shut up. Go to class, quit whining. I said, thank you for your compassion, Miss Paula. And you know what I did? I did what she told me to do. So I've been married to the same woman for 39 years. Amen? I hear guys, my wife don't tell me what to do. That's why you've been divorced 17 times, Bubba. Hey, by the way, after the fourth marriage, it might be you. Just say it. A lot of compassion, just say it. I'd be right in your, you know, right with you, but I'm scared of Paula, so I know she wouldn't hurt me. Murder's been discussed, but do you want easy? Not really. You don't. You think you do, you don't. You want it, you want just whatever the hard thing is to be worth it. Kids, a pain. Oh my Lord. What a pain these kids have been. Expensive. I mean, I have three daughters. They, they're adult. They still come home and eat my food. They don't knock. They have a key to our house. They don't live there. What are they doing with the key to our house? Eat our food. What's the deal? Keep coming back, and then they bring boys with them. That's another pain. She whiz. And everything you do, put God first, and he would direct you and crown your efforts with success. Amen. Yes, is that true? Yes. Is, if, it, listen, if it's true, let's live like it. If it's not, let's get off the pot and go to something else. Don't be religious. Don't have a secondhand faith that was handed to you by your mother or your father, as great as that heritage may be. You have, get rid of your Sunday school faith or your courtlies. Tell me, anybody ever heard know what a courtly is? If you don't, that's okay. You probably don't need to know. In every disappointment, God is saying one of four things. One, he's saying, no, I have a better way. That's what's great about God. God never says, no, shut up. He just says, no, I got something better. I got a better idea. He might be saying slow because I have a better time. You might be saying, grow. You really need to be a stronger person before I let you have this. Of course, we're always ready for anything good. You want to give me God? I'm ready to go. Really? Are you sure? I got in a race yesterday, me and Lance Armstrong. No hair in that store. Do you know Lance was in town yesterday? And this bunch of dummies over at Nissan decided that 12,000 cyclists are going to race out at my house. So I'm like, I'm a dummy. You know, I don't know that they're there. I just know that, you know, I'm going out. I do about, I have about a 25, 26 mile thing that I do on Saturday mornings. And so I got on my cycle with my little, I look cool, I look cool in my shorts, by the way. Because <laughs> Paula said I did. So I go out and I, I notice that there's a police and there's a bunch of stuff. And so I go on my route. And guess what? I joined the race route. 
Oh, no's right. And my, and my route, this route has a particular hill that is just God, can I say God awful? God awful. And so I, I can make it up this hill, but I just about die every time I do. Well, here's what's happened. Here what happened. Because I'm now, I'm racing with about 150 of my best friends who I've never met. And by the way, if you are a cyclist and I'm a cyclist, can you help me cycle People who cycle are stuck up. Be nice to people. They think you're a bunch of stuck up intruders. And that's why they run over you. That's free. That's free. I'm charged for that. I'm racing with these people who've got Fondo on the side. I'm sure that's got to be something serious and important. Mine's got Bondo on my side, you know. So here's what I'm doing. Because I'm racing with these people, usually I have a pace. I know what that pace is, but I gotta, I gotta show that I'm, you know, you, you, you know, hubris and pride gets involved. And so I'm like, man, I'm doing pretty good. I fail to realize I have nothing left for this hill. Seriously. Have you ever breathed? My, my, my body could do it. Have you ever breathed and then you get your, it's like you hit the bottom? You're, you're laboring so hard. I, it was like I was drowning. I was, I just, oh my God, what am I doing? And when I got, I, I got up it, but boy, I thought I, seriously, I said, I may die here. At least I'll die in shorts <laughs> and spandex. It's always been my dream. But I got home and I was, you know what? Hey, here's the deal. I can't ride with those people. I just can't. I just don't have yet what I'm not developed at the place where I can do it. I just, I admit it. Amen. It's stupid to think that you are ready for certain things. God knows you're not ready. Amen. And if you just continue to whine and moan and sit on your butt, you won't be ready. So get up and push back a little bit. Be a fighter. God may be saying, no, slow, grow, then he might be saying, go, 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 go. There will never be a better moment. But you know what? It scares you, right? I mean, there are some things that God wants you to go ahead and do that he hasn't taken the intimidation factor out of it yet. I was going on a long, I've just got my motorcycle service. And so I was going on an extended drive yesterday after my cycling deal. I'm thinking, I need to get on something with a motor. So I'm going, I'm about 70 miles out and I got brand new brakes. I know better, but I just, uh, there's a road I'm supposed to turn down and I punch my brakes. And if you've ever had a motorcycle with new brakes, they lock, they lock up really easily. Oh, it did. And I'm going, oh, I'm like, oh my God, I'm dead. The cycle didn't kill me. It'll beat a bike. And you know, because of my adroit, abilities and astute capacities and cat-like reflexes. <laughs> no, I didn't. Thank you, God. I, met, I, I got out of the slide and it was okay. But what I did do is I stopped and I checked myself. <laughs> you leave it up to the imagination with that. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know what? The, Riding a motorcycle is stupid. <laughs> now, how am I going to get home? Get back on that motorcycle. They, my point is this, is that sometimes engaging, even in God's will for our lives, will be frightening and dangerous. And he just says, go ahead and do it anyway. Amen? He doesn't give any of us the guarantee that it will all work he just simply says, come on, join me in the adventure. I'm ready. You're ready. Let's get out there and let's do it. Let's get off the couch. Let's stop whining and let's get in the game. Amen. You'll fall, but I'll be with you. You'll lose, but you won't lose anything worth losing. Listen, you won't have all the best equipment, but you'll have everything you need. And at the end of the day, listen, it'll be worth it. When you stand before God and hear him say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. What, that, what is that day going to be like?
going to be awesome. I'm going to be there and watch every one of you high five Jesus. High five, high five. Or whatever we do at a football game. Let's pray. Father, thank you this day. Be our teacher. Father, just I pray in Jesus' name that you would just put your big arms around us. And though we're upset and mad and we try to wiggle away, don't let us go. Wrestle us to the ground and love us back to life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a good one.